So we're really excited for this event. We have Alex Vitality. So Alex is professor of sociology at Brooklyn College and coordinator of the policing and social justice project there. He has spent the last 25 years writing about policing and consults both police departments and human rights organizations internationally. He is also a frequent essayist whose writings have appeared in the New York Daily News, New York Times, The Nation, Gotham Gazette, and New Inquiry. Next up, we have Yvette Allé. Yvette is a grassroots organizer, LGBTQ community leader, and artist. Her experiences growing up in Southern California as an undocumented person and as the child of an incarcerated person have informed her activism throughout her career. She currently serves as the statewide coordinator for Californians United for a Responsible Budget, a statewide coalition of over 75 grassroots organizations working to reduce the number of people imprisoned, the number of prisons and jails, and to shift state uh, and local spending from corrections and policing to human services. And I'd also like to say that critical resistance is a proud member of Californians United for a Responsible Budget, so we work very closely with them. Um, Yvette's intersectional approach to movement building is evident in the breadth and scope of her work. In 2010, Yvette founded, co-founded Asuka, an incubator for uh, uh, queer trans POC artists and fundraising platform for LGBTQ and immigrant rights organizations. She currently serves on the board of Voices Neighborhood Council and as a budget advocate representing South LA's District 9. Her work as a local representative has focused on supporting community empowerment through grassroots participation and advocating for greater economic opportunity and equity for the people of South LA. So to events left is Laura uh, Ramos, who is a organizer, a member of Critical Resistance Los Angeles, and Laura is also uh, works in uh, service provision, part primarily looking at uh, mental health care. And next up is Kim McGill. Kim, What's that? I'm join so sorry us. I'm late. Uh, so, Kim, I had a bio for you. Oh, here we go. Kim McGill is an organizer and co-founder of the Youth Justice Coalition of Los Angeles, where she recruits and trains youth organizers about the issues of the juvenile injustice system, police and prison funding the school to prison pipeline, creating grassroots movements to accomplish change, inequities in the justice system, and alternatives to incarceration. And what's uh, notable about the Youth Justice Coalition is that it is composed of people that have been through the system, are directly impacted by policing, imprisonment, um, and the criminal injustice system. And so working to build up the leadership um, and the skills of those people most impacted. So give it up for our panel. So uh, I mentioned, you know, we're uh, Critical Resistance is an abolitionist organization, and we're really thrilled to have this formation come together of really powerful organizers, thinkers, um, writers, and we're really excited for this event. I I was personally stoked about Alex's book. I want to say just a few things about why I think it's really important in this moment, and then I'll shut up. We'll have our panelists uh, speak. Each person will uh, kind of present on their work for about 10 minutes. Um, I'll have a few questions after that to kind of just get some discussion going, and then we'll have a good chunk of time for Q&A for you all to you know, post questions and, and engage in some discussion as well. After that, we'll um, we'll end up just kind of having conversations, mingling. You'll have an opportunity to buy books, get some resources, information, and we'll call it a day. Sound good? Great. Uh, so, you know, the end of policing is the book is it really the analysis is important because it articulates why policing itself is the problem, right? We, we have seen over the past 
particularly in the last few years, I'd say in you know, the, the kind of post-Ferguson moment of there being a really critical eye toward policing in this country, police murders, but also like the daily harassment that that comes with. Um, and as a result of that, there's been a lot of different solutions or proposed solutions to how to address the problem of policing in this country. And these reforms, for by and large, have really been about tweaking the way that policing functions. So we're, uh, it's really important for us to uplift the kind of analysis that actually says, actually, policing itself is inherently the problem. No reforms, uh, no liberal reforms are going to be able to address the problem of police. So in the 10 chapters of the book, in a conclusion, um, Alex Vitale succinctly summarizes the different forms that policing, ha policing has taken on in the 21st century and articulates the reforms that fail to address the problem and also, importantly, the potential alternatives to work towards and test out. Uh, he shows that the problems that reform thinking leads towards and provides a voice in the academic world that we generally do not hear. So it's fundamentally a call for abolition in a time that pushes by and large for reform. So that's why we at CR are hosting Alex Vitale. Uh, the analysis is extremely valuable and provides part of what can not only help in showing statistically and factually why policing does not work, or rather, doesn't work for our communities, uh, but also articulates against the myth of you know, the police that serve us and the image of the police as community service. It shows how perpetuating that kind of myth is dangerous, and ultimately it shows why we must fight for a world without policing. So, are you all excited to get this going? Absolutely. Yeah. Great. <laughs> so I'm going to kick it off to Alex. All right. And take it away. All right, Mohammed, you'll get your kickback later for that nice introduction. <laughs> Actually, uh, uh, Verso has uh, turned these books over to the organizations to raise money. So every dime you spend on the books goes back into the organizing. So uh, just that's my little sales pitch on that. Um, so I've been doing this work either as an academic or an organizer as a writer for uh, now it's close to 30 years. And uh, what I've seen during that period is a constant set of cycling through police abuse, crisis, resistance, fake reform, and then more police abuse, more murders, more crisis, and then more fake reforms. And then so one of the main motivations for writing this book was to try to get us out of the cycle of asking for things or agreeing to things or basically being demobilized by things that aren't going to make any difference. We look back at uh, Rodney King, the kinds of things that were proposed after that made no difference and right away we've got the Rampart scandal and you know the, just the cycle of abuse continues. So let's look at a couple of the reforms that are uh, hot topics right now. Everybody's in love with body cameras. That's going to solve all our problems. Now we, we many of us want body cameras. Many well-meaning activists want body cameras because they think it will bring accountability that we'll see what the police are doing and as a result it will either impede some police abuse or lead to better accountability of officers. And in exchange for that we're willing to give up some privacy because body cameras are going to be on us all the time. The police will do what they want to do with that footage. But that calculation is really misguided because on the one hand I don't think we're going to get much accountability. How many cases of videotaped abuse have we seen where there are no consequences? The footage is only as valuable as an accountability mechanism as the mechanisms for accountability are. But we don't have any mechanisms of accountability. We don't have adequate 
police investigations, DA investigations, civilian investigations. The DAs are not interested in prosecuting the cops. Even when the cases get to trial, the legal frameworks allow the police to just say, I was afraid. And even when there's no possible justification, juries just decide to let them get off anyway. But also, the other side of the equation is turning out to be much worse than we imagined. So we had a really big study in DC recently of body cameras. They did a multi-year experimental design. This is like the gold standard for this kind of research where they took neighborhoods that gave them body cams and then took similar neighborhoods and didn't give them body cams and then they compared the two neighborhoods over time to see if there were changes in policing. They couldn't find any difference in arrest rates, abuse rates, citizen complaints, how the community felt about it. There was no difference in the two sets of communities. And we're talking about a lot of neighborhoods in each group, so it wasn't just one and one. But interestingly, the DC Metropolitan Police said, well, we don't care, we're, we love it, we're gonna keep doing it anyway. Why? Because they're using it for evidence gathering. That's why they love it, because they're getting all the benefits. They're using the footage to get convictions against people, to hold people in jail longer on bail and force them to take plea deals and things like this. So not only are we not getting any accountability, we're having significant loss to our civil liberties, to our privacy, and now we hear from some of the body cam companies, they want to integrate facial recognition software, they want to integrate it into predictive policing, they can use this to populate gang databases, political policing databases, etc. What about uh, community policing? Who could be against community policing? Don't we want the police to be friendlier, to be more respectful of the community, to take direction from the community? Well, this is all a myth. We have a lot of research about community policing. In fact, there's a, a new study about community policing in LA that will be out soon from New York University Press that I, I had a chance to read an advanced version of and these studies all pretty much look the same, which is that it's the police who construct what the community is. They set the parameters for who is allowed in these meetings, who's given a voice in these meetings. There are no homeless people in these meetings. There are no undocumented people in these meetings. There are no youth in these meetings. There are no people who've been involved in the criminal justice system in these meetings. It's the same pro-police supporters that always get involved in police community interactions. But also, community policing <coughs> is about turning every community problem into a policing problem. What other part of government goes into every neighborhood and says, bring us your problems so we can figure out how to solve them? The Parks Department doesn't do that. Social Services the health department, only the police are out there in the community saying, bring us your problems. But what tools do they have to solve your problems? Handcuffs, ticket books, <laughs> guns. Those aren't the solutions our communities need for their problems. And we've got a lot of problems. We've got overdose rates that are through the roof, mass homelessness, untreated mental health, young people with no access to the formal labor market, nothing to do with themselves that's positive, failing schools. But the solution to all these is more invasive and aggressive policing in the form of gang Checking suppression of policing okay. and I school the policing. One of the, problems that are out there. <laughs> the policing of folks who are homeless or having a mental health crisis. Shall I help you call? <laughs> we, know that, we know that a quarter, at least, at a minimum, of all people killed by police in the United States are having a mental health crisis. And we don't need better trained mental health policing responses. We need actual mental health infrastructures put in place, A, so that people don't have a crisis in the first place, 
and B, when someone calls and says their son is in crisis, they actually get someone who can help their son, not someone who will kill them. School policing. School policing is the product of a totally rancid set of politics that have nothing to do with helping our young people. It all emerges in the 1990s in relationship to the super predator myth, this research conducted by right-wing criminologists who had a clear political agenda about demonizing young people of color in the period of disinvestment in their communities. And it was really important for them to define the problem of these communities as problems of sociopathic young people. Because the alternative would be to say that the problem has to do with labor markets, government disinvestment, deindustrialization. But they are opposed to framing the problem in that way. They want us to see every social problem as a problem of individual or group moral failure that will only respond to punitive, coercive state action. All these people understand is put them in jail, put them up against the wall. That's the mindset, not just of the police, but of the political leadership that has framed our problems in this way and has offered us only these solutions to our problems. So we have to get out of this mindset that policing equals public safety. Because policing has always existed primarily to manage systems of inequality, domination, and exploitation. Whether it's colonialism, slavery, the rise of industrialization, or this new kind of neoliberal form of capitalism that involves mass homelessness, growing inequality, the rise of black market activities because people have no access to jobs. That's what modern policing is. We see on television, and I'll, I'll finish and just say, we see on television, oh, they're chasing the serial killers and the horrible rapists, but that's not what police really do. Yeah, there's a few detectives who occasionally solve a homicide, but if you ever spend any time riding around with police officers, as I have for decades, they never do any of that. They hassle homeless people, they put kids up against the wall, they make low-level marijuana arrests, they write tickets because people are making too much noise. That's what policing really is. And we should be addressing those problems in ways that build up individuals, that build up communities, not tear them down. Thank you. everyone. Um, my name is Yvette. Thank you, Mohammed and Critical Resistance for having me here um, for the introduction. Uh, before I get into Curb's work, um, I want to bring it back to my personal experience with the carceral system and how that informs uh, the way that I approach movement building and organizing and the work that I do with Curb. So one of my first memories and interactions with the police is actually seeing them come to my home and drag my dad out of my house after a domestic violence incident. Um, and this would repeat itself uh, throughout my childhood until my dad was um, arrested and, and sent to prison uh, for drug charges. And so my, my idea of what the police did was break up my family. And although my, my sister and my other siblings and my mom and I suffered through domestic violence in our home, the answer for us was not removing my dad. It was having my dad get the treatment that he needed for substance use, getting the counseling and support he needed for his trauma and mental health issues. And so throughout those instances of violence, we never saw jail and incarceration as a solution. 
Also being undocumented, having our primary source of income removed from our home, ended up in homelessness for my family. Um, my sister and I had to start working at a really young age, we were 13 and 14, in order to sustain my family, my, my mom, as a consequence of the violence and the isolation, had severe mental health issues. And so our family was left with little to no resources. And the police was never there offering resources for our family. We had to rely on com some community members in the church to sustain ourselves and be fed. And so when I think about what community needs in order to be safe, I don't think of the police. I think about the um, grassroots infrastructure that was there that sustained my family through those difficult moments. And I look at the possible investment in the community that could have sustained us better. And so my work with CURB, and CURB stands for Californians United for a Responsible Budget. It's a really boring name, and it's that way for a reason. Um, so CURB was founded back in 2013 by one of our founding members was Critical Resistance, in fact, in order to navigate the uh, budget landscape of the state, in order to be stealth and start defunding prisons and jails and investing back into the community. And we're nearly 80 organizations strong. Um, YJC, the Youth Justice Coalition, is also a super active member of CURB. And so our foundation is abolitionist. And I personally identify as an abolitionist myself because I know that the solutions for me, for my family, for my community don't lie in incarceration and that those systems are fundamentally uh, abusive and founded in uh, systemic racism, slavery, and they're just an extension of that in modern day. Uh, CURB seeks to defund prisons and jails, but also uh, decarcerate, so bring people home. We support legislation and co-sponsor uh, co legislation that does that. Recently, we helped uh, pass the RISE Act, which eliminated sentence enhancements for prior drug convictions. One of the relics from the war on our communities that we experienced here in LA very strongly in the 1990s. We also seek to invest in community-based alternatives to incarceration. So alternatives to incarceration don't always mean community-based, so we're very specific about that. One of the campaigns that we have is the Reimagine 109 campaign, which Critical Resistance is also a part of, and that seeks to shift 50% of AB 109 funding back into community-based alternatives and away from the sheriffs. So one of the ways that uh, the police and the sheriffs really have control over the narratives and the policies is through funding. So budgets are a way to target their movement and their activities. I like to think about budgets as reimagined futures or imagined futures. And so when we're, when we're drafting budgets, whether it's at the local level, at, at the county level, at the state level, we're already anticipating what we would like our communities to look like. And so when we take a look at the way that the police has co-opted the language around public safety, we try to turn that around and reimagine what public safety really looks like for our communities. It means investing in mental health treatment. It means investing in housing, affordable housing for folks. It means uh, mental health treatment that is accessible and community informed. And so the way that CURB seeks to do that is through local advocacy work, through our policy work. Right now we have two new bills that are also targeting enhancements through this legislative cycle. We're also involved in bail implementation and bail reform um, at the local level. So right now CURB is part of a uh, group of folks that are working on uh, reimagining what implementation for bail will look like. So at the state level, are folks familiar with SB 10? Yeah, bail reform at the state level. It seeks to undercut money bail. It can't completely eliminate money bail because it's actually in our state constitution. And so that's a little tricky. It requires a two thirds vote. But what SB 10 is trying to do is uh, move um, away from money bail and towards uh, risk assessment tools, and those are problematic. 
And so at the county level, we're trying to undermine the use of risk assessment tools, which are fundamentally racist. And there's very little transparency around what, what factors are being calculated into these risk assessment tools. Also, there, it opens up the space for el more electronic monitoring. And so that is another extension of the carceral system in our communities. And so we're trying to anticipate that implementation at the county level to make sure that LA County says no to risk assessment tools, that we're focusing on needs-based approach to, um, to uh, release and release on people's own recognizance. And so what needs-based assessment means is looking at what a person needs in order to attend their day in court. Sometimes it's as little as a bus ticket, um, housing, employment. That is an opportunity to actually meet the needs of the, the people of Los Angeles. There's a cycle of incarceration in our jails because of folks not having any homes, not having the income to be able to make it to their day in court. So we're trying to address bail in that way. A huge part of our work is our jail fight work. And so here in LA, there is a $3.5 billion jail expansion plan that will build two new jails. So one that would replace Men's Central, which is being toted as a mental health jail. And that language is part of this wave of carceral humanism, right? We're gonna adopt this language of progressive folks that want to meet the needs of their community and say, hey, we're, we're being gender responsive with our jails and prisons. We're, being, we're providing mental health treatment in jails. What a lot of folks don't know that LA is the largest mental health institution in the world. LA County has the largest jail system in the world. And yet we're planning to invest another $3.5 billion. One of the, the other jail that's slated to be built will be out in uh, uh, like 80, over 80 miles away from LA City proper. And that will be a women's jail. So women will be housed both in the mental health jail and at the, this facility that will be over 80 miles away from LA City proper. Women are already not visited as much compared to men. Because women in the community are the ones that are doing the visiting, right? Mm -hmm. Women, specifically black and brown women, are disproportionately affected by bail. They are the ones that are paying the bail and putting their homes up. So I see uh, our jail fights, our prison work, as a woman's issue, and a, a woman of color issue, a black and brown women's issue. And it's important to be able to center the people that are most be, that are being affected the most by the carceral system in the conversation, the undocumented women that are um, that are being affected by the carceral system. Uh, Latinx women are actually the fastest growing incarcerated population and our communities are being strategically uh, separated through these narratives of private and public prisons, right? The, the experience of undocumented folks are also not being centered in jail fight work, in prison work, and that needs to happen. Along with the way that our youth are being targeted, I want to give it up to YJC and all the work that they've been doing around gang injunctions, gang injunctions and the huge victory that happened three weeks ago, a month ago, um, that um, ended gang injunctions in the city of LA. That's a huge victory, but the fight is still going on in other parts of the state, in San Francisco, um, in Oakland. And so we need to be able to link the, the work that's happening across the state, and that's what CURB does. We are able to link the work of independent of individual jail fights across the state, of the work of our individual members, whether it's uh, direct services that they provide or organizing. And so CURB is uh, the home and um, the, the nexus of a lot of the work that's happening across the state. And I'm really proud to represent CURB as the coordinator um, and really proud of CURB membership that um, hired two directly impacted women of color to lead and, and coordinate that work. So I'll leave it there, but um, thank you very much. So I'm Laura Ramos. I'm a clinical social worker for a community-based program. Um, and so I'm bringing that perspective into my organizing with critical resistance. I'm going to piggyback off of what some of that said, especially when it comes to Reimagine 109. 
Reimagine 109 was a response to the abuses that were occurring in state prisons in California. So the federal government comes in and intervenes because there's mass overcrowding in these prisons, which is resulting in abuses such as lack of health care and mental health care or just the complete absence of it, right? And so there's this intervention that comes into play with the Reentry and Realignment Act. However, the focal point becomes moving people from the state prison system to the jail system, right? Instead of focusing on reentry services that would actually provide and link people to the services they need so they could decrease recidivism rates, they're just they're just perpetuating that cycle, right? Which kind of goes to show that the system is working as it was intended to, right? They want to control people, they want to dominate people, and the way they do that is by creating um, legislation that maintains this system. So right now, what Critical Resistance is doing in regards to AB 109 is facilitating workshops with service providers in LA County, right? And some of the discussions that we've had with these service providers is around mental health. And this also relates a lot to what Alex said, is that a lot of times the service providers feel like they have no other choice but to call on the police. Right? So we have like this process of social conditioning that has occurred because we just automatically assume or we accept that the police are the only people that can come and intervene. Right? Because and most of the time it's only because it's the only option. Right? And that's not coincidental. They've monopolized crisis response within our communities. And so we're taking a look at what does it look like, right? When a service provider is out in the community and their client, their patient, is having a mental health crisis. Well, a, a professional psychiatric assessment team doesn't have the capacity most of the time to go out. So that, that means the police are responding to these situations, right? And instead of de-escalating the situation, most of the time it leads to an escalation that results in harm done to the community member, the service provider, and at worst death, right? So we want to see what we, we were trying to imagine what it would look like if 50% of the funds of AB 109 were given to community-based programs that actually deal with, with all the social issues that lead to incarceration and recidivism, right? What would it look like if we were able to effectively intervene to provide people with the services they need when they're living with addiction, homelessness, things like that? Um, and so that's kind of the work that we've been doing. We want to move away from a punitive model and really be able to allocate uh, this, all this funding into these community-based programs. Um, because right now the system is just it's completely ineffective. Um, and that's kind of the work that critical resistance is doing at the moment. I just want to also give some love to, uh, to Joaquin, he also goes by in the back, right there from the Justice Coalition. He's <laughs> <laughs> you can take the credit card out of it. <laughs> um, so with the Youth Justice Coalition, as, as was said, um, we got involved in the work because all of us have been through the system. Um, we've been detained, incarcerated, some people deported, and most of us are family members also. And when we came together, we were really tasked with looking first at why was it that LA County was locking up more people than any place else in the world. And the more we went back, thinking that maybe it started with the 1980s and the war on youth through a, through a racist war on gangs, um, the more we unearthed more stuff about LA's history. So I don't think you can separate LA's history from the rest of the nation or say that the rest of the nation hasn't endured um, horrible oppression in terms of juvenile and criminal injustice policies. But I think that LA is an epicenter for mass incarceration and it's rarely been lifted up that way. So I just wanted to start there. Um, you can just go a few blocks north and you'll get to Men's Central Jail and Twin Towers. That's the largest jail facility in the world and part of the largest jail system in the world, as Yvette already said. Um, just north of that, a few blocks, is Central Juvenile Hall, or also known as East Lake Juvenile Hall, the largest juvenile hall in the world. And part of three juvenile halls will make up the largest juvenile hall complex in the world. Um, if you stand on top of Men's Central Jail, you'll see numerous probation um, area offices um, and 
probation headquarters is in Downey, not too far south of here, making it the largest probation system in the world. Um, at Men's Central Jail, and also just shortly to the east, right on the border between Monterey Park and East LA, um, is headquarters to the Sheriff's Department, the largest Sheriff's Department in the world. Um, <laughs> um, if you go, if you look, really, just a few blocks north to Los Angeles, or would be like a few blocks um, east and north to Los Angeles Street, um, that was where originally the Spanish called Calle de Negro, a very racist term, referring to the fact that people were forced to live there, first indigenous people forced to live there, and other darker or brown-skinned people in an age when the Spanish considered themselves gente de razón and created the mission system to incarcerate and, and enslave native peoples on their own land. So by the time the Americans illegally took over this land from 1848 to 1871, they not only um, continued that system, but made it even more brutal. So the Marshal's Office was the first law enforcement agency in this area, <coughs> actually created its funding off of taking Native peoples who were paid at the end of their week, working their own land, not in wages, but in alcohol, rounding them up into a horse corral right in that area, which is now Union Station, but at that time was the, the heart of Aire Negro, or near Placito Olvera, and then auctioning them off to the highest bidder for slave labor for the next week. And that's how the Marshal's Office was first funded, our first law enforcement. Between 1848 and 1871, LA, not Alabama, Calabama had the largest lynching rate in the nation, the highest lynching rate. And I think it's important that a lynching memorial was started yesterday in Alabama, but I also think it's very indicative of how history is written in this nation, that it looks at lynching from 1870 to 1950 and leaves out that period where LA County led the nation in lynching. And that was largely using gang, our first gang labels, where brown people that were trying to reclaim land and livestock that had been taken illegally right after the illegal Mexican-American War were labeled right away as bandits, hunted down, and lynched either in so-called legal um, tribunals or just in the wilderness by vigilante mobs. Um, most of those folks weren't even accounted for. We have the highest lynching rate with the accounted names that we know of, but not all the names that disappeared. Um, in addition, we were the most violent area of the country all the way up until the 1900. When you compared us to, for example, New York City, um, our violence rates um, here in LA County when compared to New York City at that time, between, again, 1848 and the turn of the century, um, were so high that it's the only region in the United States where a foreign government sent in their troops to protect their citizens. The French, tr French troops came in to protect their citizens. If we had the same homicide rate now as we did then, we'd be, leaving, we'd be losing about 16,000 people a year in LA County um, to homicide alone, not including police homicides. Um, and we have a fake Chinatown because the original Chinatown was destroyed in the Chinese massacre of 1871, still to this day uh, the most brutal mass lynching in US history. Um, a mob of between three and 600 people, depending on what accounts you listen to, um, of white and Latino men um, descended on Chinatown, led by the marshal's office, by law enforcement, and by the mayor's office. In response to a shootout, this is another use of early gang labeling to excuse uh, mob violence, when there was a shootout between rival Tom factions and they illegally killed um, a white man who was considered like the Colonel Sanders of LA, a beloved chicken rancher, but who also, the only reason he would be in that area um, where Chinatown also was, you know, forced into being in that same area of Calle Negro around Placito Vera, was where all the houses of prostitution, the gambling halls, and the saloons were. Um, so it's, it's notable that, again, the killing of a single white man led to the massacre of the Chinese community. 18 men lynched that night, boys also, and as many as 83 people killed, Chinatown burned to the ground. So when you look at our Chinatown, it's a fake Hollywood movie set stuck onto um, buildings, at the front of buildings many decades later. I only go there, go there because I think we have a particular um, responsibility in Los Angeles to name our history, to challenge our history, and to take responsibility for the fact that it's been exported now to the rest of the world. We can jump all the way ahead, which there's too much history in between, but we also gave the world Richard Nixon and the war on drugs, came out of LA County. Ronald Reagan, who had his so-called career here, and then his politics started here, um, and a war on drugs on steroids. The first use of militarized policing here in LA County, first use of battering rounds and police helicopters, the first creation of SWAT by Gates even before he was chief, um, and militarized policing in that way, and the first gang units and the first use of not only gang units, but gang databases, gang injunctions, and gang enhancements. Um, so I, I often like to say to people, um, bomb LA, free the world, save LA, or free LA, free the world, you can choose, but if we don't think geographically about these issues, and take on those regions that have a particularly vicious history, then we won't change conditions for the United States and the world. Um, the YGC, I think, has also um, been trying to work, like a lot of people, on what does it mean to have an abolition framework going forward? How do you do that in the short term? 
And so for us, um, we, don't, we don't support policies or campaigns unless they meet three criteria. No new cash, no new cages, no new cops. And that way, even if it's a so-called reform, we have a very clear parameter about how to gauge whether or not we should support it. And then we work on our organizing, we try to, in um, five different areas. One is data. How do we make sure that our work is driven by data? Who's getting arrested? What's their race? What's their gender? What's their geography? Because we have justice by geography in LA, where you're treated very differently if you're in Palmdale or Pomona than if you're in other areas of the county, for example. Um, what, is our, what is our data collection around gang databases? So we use data to get a, a statewide audit, for example, of the Cal Gang database to show how corrupt it was when they didn't believe community that it was corrupt. Or we used a public record app request to um, expose who was on the database in the first place because it never, that had never been released. Even though we knew that children were being put in the database, it was that public record app request that we were able to prove that people as young as 10 were on the database. Um, we used data to expose who was being killed by law enforcement in LA County. There wasn't a comprehensive list, so we started with family members telling us their stories, our own family members as well as others we met, and then went to the coroner's office and got a list when law enforcement refused to give it to us. The second thing is around diversion. Um, how do we pull people out of a, a process we call Starve the Beast? How do you consider every single person as um, a meal for the system? Um, and how do you pull them out of the system? And so for us, that's meant um, on the grassroots level, a lot of court support, what some people call participatory defense, some people call community defense, where you prepare your, um, young people and families to go to court. You fight every case, um, no matter how small, no matter how large. And being in court and monitoring court and watching the court, you can have a tremendous outcome on the sentencing. Um, but it also means just in the baby steps of this, but trying to grow alternatives to 911. For example, having a building that's police and probation free, where people are using transformative justice to solve our problems in our building, in our communities, in our homes, as opposed to calling 911. Um, and then hopefully by this summer, training like cadres of people around the state. And it's not a YJC effort, but a community effort led by many people in the community um, to build an alternative to 911. Um, as part of diversion, too, is how do we um, change laws to, pull, to decriminalize huge aspects? And let me know when I'm going too long. Two more minutes, okay. Um, so for diversion, we focused a lot on the number one cause of ticketing for LA County youth was um, fare evasion. About 10,000 young people a year getting these crazy tickets, $250, and they go up to $900, and we couldn't pay them, could turn into warrants, end up in jail or juvenile hall by not paying them. Um, so we first decriminalized fare evasion here in LA County and then decriminalized it statewide. So young people can no longer be arrested or or, um, or, or criminalized or charged based on fair evasion. Fines we haven't eliminated in the state, but we did eliminate them in LA County. Um, we closed the juvenile <coughs> court here in LA and got amnesty for 250,000 past tickets. Some of those people had had juvenile tickets on their records since the 1960s and still couldn't get their driver's license in 2015-16. Um, and we just recently worked um, to win a diversion um, for young people in LA County away from arrest, um, working with the uh, what is now an Office of Youth Development and Diversion, what was just an Office of Diversion, we pushed truly hard for youth development to be included. Um, so as many as 10,000 youth a year won't have any kind of criminal record, criminal index, or fingerprinting at all. Um, in terms of divestment, we've worked hard in building of families here in the county and statewide um, in terms of fees, fines, um, charging for the time that the young person's in juvenile hall or camp. We have a 5% campaign yet to be realized, but we finally just did win like the first youth development department for LA County, so we're hopeful that it will eventually lead to this. But if we just took 5% of law enforcement budgets, just the major departments, not all 57 law enforcement agencies, but just the sheriffs, the LAPD, the courts, the DAs. Um, this Anthony too from you just mentioned at the end of the um, That would be equal to $236 million a year for young people. And, when we went on a, a march, a 50-mile march across the county, what people prioritized were um, that would that would pay for 50,000 youth jobs, 100 youth centers, each with a million-dollar year budget, and um, 1,000 peace builders or intervention workers in our schools and streets. Um, and then another example of that is we're pushing hard for the end of discrimination on victims' comp funds. So people that are allegedly gang involved, if we can pass a bill this year, would no longer be denied victims' comp or their families, um, or people that are undocumented no longer be denied victim's comp. We're trying to get victim's comp fund locally. We tried to get it in the state, but it was taken out of the bill. We, we fought and were unsuccessful. Um, for people whose loved ones are killed by law enforcement, too, and are close to getting a, victim's bill, uh, a family bill of rights there. Um, and then finally, decarceration. Um, Yvette talked about the jail fights. We're really proud to work with many people in the room, many people on the panel on that, um, working to close youth prisons. and. As an immediate step to that, to close juvenile hall, the central juvenile hall, the one I first mentioned, um, 
and replace it as an alternative to the women's jail with a women and girls justice center where young women and girls could check in in the morning and get what they need. Not check into law enforcement, but check into community basically. Um, have daycare on site, healthcare on site, education on site, college and union um, apprenticeships on site, and then go home at night as opposed to building a huge jail facility. So those are just a few things we're working on. Um, we're really, really honored to be here. Um, it's very rare to have a conversation that talks about abolition either of jails, let alone policing, which I think is even more rare. Um, and, and I always appreciate critical resistance being at the forefront of that. As us being babies in the movement, uh, we really consider not all the people in CR, not, not their old, our elders, but for sure the people that started CR, we consider themselves elders in this movement and have gained a lot of um, wisdom and resources and encouragement from them. So really appreciate it. Give it up one more time for the panel. A lot of a lot of amazing work that the organizations are doing. Um, so really appreciate hearing from all of you. Uh, it's really inspiring, particularly given you know recent recent solid victories that have happened. One that I will also throw in the mix that um, organizations actually in LA also threw down for. Uh, was uh, we put an end to Urban Shield. And if you don't know what Urban Shield is, going kind of on the theme of largest, 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 right? Urban Shield was the largest SWAT training in the world. Um, it brought together police departments from across the country and police units from across the world that actually was in the Bay Area. Um, and our chapter in Oakland, after five years, we worked in a coalition and last month put it to an end. So that was a, a big victory. Um, but it just goes to show the, the, the victories that are possible. Often when we are up against the system of policing, prison industrial complex more broadly, we're up against a war machine that is enormous. Uh, but the importance of doing the daily organizing and the, the steady struggle to chip away at these systems I think is, is really important. So. Um, with that, I'm going to pose a, a question to the panel. Um, this is not directed at anyone in particular, um, but you can obviously answer from your different vantage points. So uh, the first question I have is, what have you seen um, in either your, you know, your work, your organizing, your research, uh, what is the greatest or one of the most critical obstacles to organizing against policing, imprisonment, um, kind of, we can focus on, um, on policing, but if you wanted to also kind of tie in imprisonment and see how those systems are interrelated. But, um, so Alex, you know, from your perspective of, of doing a lot of research for years, um, you really know the ins and outs of how policing functions, but also, from the organizers, you know, what are the organizing obstacles um, that you've come up against? So I'll just open it up if you wanted to begin. Yeah, yeah. so, and just so folks know, you know, I, I started as an organizer, so uh, I'm not speaking strictly from a, a, a theoretical point of view. You know, I, I spent a number of years organizing and still do. Uh, and in fact, we, we have a campaign uh, that is uh, initiated by students at Brooklyn College and they have come and met with me but this is a student campaign to reduce the presence of police on campus. We've got our own campus police but also we have a frequent NYPD presence on our campus and uh, at Brooklyn College is mostly students of color. A lot of first generation college goers, first generation born in the United States and they live in communities that are heavily impacted by really problematic policing. So one of the things I said to them to get to your question about impediments is, is that we, the first time you make a kind of public call for reducing the security policing presence on campus, the administration is going to go out and find some staff members and some students who are going to come out and say that they're afraid. That once upon a time they were afraid of someone or they were victimized and that 
they want all the intensive ID checks and they want a heavy uniform presence around the school because they are afraid. And this is the same thing we see in the community context. You go to these police organized, police community meetings and people talk about they're afraid. Those kids, those gang bangers, those drug dealers, you've got to protect us from them. So that's why, you know, in, in the book and in my work, a lot of focus on producing the positive alternatives so that we can produce more sense of safety for people and that we can involve people in the co-production of safety. And this is really important, for instance, in the schools context. What we have in too many schools is a war between the teachers and the administration on one side and the students on the other side. The teachers and administrators are afraid, frustrated, lack resources, and they blame the students, and they criminalize the students, and they throw the students out. And even the best intentioned teachers have problems resisting the logic of the circumstances they're in. But one of the things we know is that that system just leads to expulsions, suspensions, and criminalization, so that maybe you save 80% of the students by criminalizing and destroying the lives of 20% of the students. And this is what we see at the community level, too, is that kind of logic. It's okay to destroy 20% of the community if it'll help the other 80. Of course, it never really does, but that's the mindset. If instead we embraced a kind of restorative justice model in schools, which some schools have done with great success, from top to bottom, the whole ethos of the school is that we're all in this together. And that if we want to get an education out of this, we got to figure out how to work together on this. But that requires bringing some resources to bear. We can't just talk away the problems that young people bring in the front door every day because they've got real problems and that play a role in the kinds of difficulties that schools are experiencing. So we need to have counseling staff and we need to have actual material resources because sometimes, you know, kids are acting out because, and doing poorly in school because they don't have a safe place to study. We need to be able to open up the school in the afternoon and have supervision there. We need tutoring services. That stuff costs money. So it can't just be we're going to call everything restorative justice and now everything's great. It's got to be the whole package. And when we do that, one of the first things that happens is students feel safer. And then you don't get the calls for more policing and metal detectors and the whole nine yards. Yeah. Yeah, feel free. Yeah, I would say from an organizing perspective, um, here in Los Angeles, there's a lot of limitations. Just the geography and the urban landscape of Los Angeles is really limiting. And I would also say, in terms of policing, um, the rhetoric around policing and incarceration, for the Latino community specifically, like pervasive anti-blackness prevents us from seeing this as also a non-black problem. And so folks that are also targeted, non-black Latinos, will often dismiss um, issues of policing and incarceration as a black problem and also erase the intersection of Latinidad and black identity in the process. And so that's definitely an issue of reframing and addressing those, those issues within our community in order, to, uh, in order to participate in dismantling those systems, right? Black folks are 8% uh, or 9% of the population, over 30% of folks in our jails. That's, that's, a, that's a huge issue. And it must be addressed in all communities and take and take it as a Los Angeles problem that needs to be addressed. So that's a huge issue as well. I would also say that talking about the the fear component uh, is really is really a huge piece of that, um, and the co-opting of the narratives of, of safety. And so when we think of public safety, like I mentioned before, we automatically think of police because they've promoted themselves and build themselves as those that are presenting public safety for the community. And we, like at CURB, our, our members like to think of public safety as supportive housing, 
as uh, access to education, um, as mental health treatment, those things are public safety, right? So the co-opting of the narrative of safety by the police and also fiscal responsibility, right? Even it, within the name of CURB, we're, we're for a responsible budget um, and it's intentional. It's, it's reframing what responsibility to the community is. A responsible spending for our community is not is not wasting our money on police. It's actually investing in our community. So really reframing what those narratives are, dispelling the the myths around who's affected and who's not affected, and tying in the marginalization of vulnerable communities with our collective sense of safety. Right when those those folks that are the most vulnerable queer and trans folks, black folks, undocumented folks, if those folks are centered in the conversations, then we're all safer. Like our liberation is tied to each other. And so being able to center that conversation is really important. I, I can't agree more with the fear tactics, right? Like that's the number one thing you hear all the time that the police or law enforcement are there to serve as gatekeepers to help us identify who is a safety risk and who is not, and they've done that effectively, in, and they've created structures like, for example, drug courts, right? Drug courts that people come into contact with law enforcement first, and then law enforcement gets to decide, is this person safe enough to refer up to community services, or should we just keep them locked up, right? So then service providers have this major misconception that the police are there to help them decide who is worth and who is safe enough to work with, right? So they're constantly creating barriers to people, uh, to people access to just basic human needs. I think there's um, barriers that are part of us that we control and barriers that are system. So I'll start with the ones that we control. I think there's been many movement opportunities in, in LA and the nation, but we don't have movement identity or movement infrastructure anymore. The movements that we built in the past those of us that came up after the 1980s have been long cut off from those. We've been cut off from the historical leaders as well as the tactics and tools that they built. Um, and the right has picked those tactics up and built a really strong ground game um, with those same tactics. Meanwhile, internationally, we see huge movements, the kind of movements you need to affect real change because they don't prioritize their organizational or individual identities, fame and fortune over a movement identity. So I think that's on us to change. <coughs> Sorry, I'm gonna cop in a minute, so I'm not to stop that. Um, the other thing I think that's a huge issue for us individually, uh, for our organizations, is that we have, since the 70s, a lot of what's happened to organizations in terms of infrastructure is the chasing of dollars as opposed to the chase, chasing of justice. And that means we're accountable to funders and to boards of directors as opposed to being accountable to the ground. We're not building base building organizations, we're not building um, huge numbers of leaders, and that's not driving <coughs> the work that we're doing. <coughs> Um, yeah, I will just I'll just pick up on on some of the things that uh, were raised around. I think you mentioned a really important point around uh, the implementing restorative justice in the schools, as that that the response is that kids feeling safer. And I think that that's really important because uh, a lot of what we, how we think about abolition and how we think about you know, uh, challenging these systems is to uh, abolish and to tear down while we build, right? So that I think is a, is a perfect example of, of both building what we want to see and that actually leading to us pushing against, in this case, the fear mongering Right, pushing against the systems, the things that we're, we're up against, and to, to use that as an effective tool. Um, so I think that's a really great example. Um, uh, in terms of shifting the, the narrative around public safety, that is, has, continues and will always continue to be a struggle. But I think for all of our organizations, that's a really critical piece, whether it be around youth, whether it be around um, you know, imprisonment and the role of police in society. But Kim, if you wanted to just kind of pick up from what, where you were talking. I, I really apologize, I'm getting, I got a cold, or getting cold. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think on the system stuff, the things that challenge most of us in YJC the most are, we already mentioned the budget, the budget inequity. 
the fact that not only do we depend on law enforcement or lockups or incarceration or punishment systems as the only way to solve community problems, but we've also just given our budgets over to them. And if I walked up to you, like I walked out into the audience and I was like, oh man, I really like these sunglasses. And I really like this phone too. <laughs> People would be up, you know, they would be incensed, but we watch the police take our budgets every day, prison system, we don't really say much. Um, politicians also driven by huge um, campaign contributions from law enforcement and prison guards unions is a huge barrier. I think that um, mission landslide on the part of law enforcement. So we've seen over the last 15 years where not only have they, are they dominating the definition of public safety and the implementation of those kind of strategies, but now they're encroaching on social service systems. So they are the, so, the new social workers. They are running youth centers, so-called youth centers. They are running jobs programs for young people. They are running, they get millions and millions of dollars for cadet programs even though they have a really high rate of sexually um, you know, molesting and having relationships with young people in their cadet programs. Um, there's a false narrative that drives the work that continues. Um, so, for example, this population of young people, today's generation, least violent, least arrested generation since the 1950s. And yet what's still promoted is that young people, particularly young people of color, are very dangerous. Another example that every time there's a, a mass school shooting in a white school in a white neighborhood, it's young people of color that are locked down. So one of the hardest things we've had to fight, we've been trying to get police out of schools for years now, and even just ending random searches. And it's been one of the toughest fights because it's the violence in, and also very rare, um, white middle class schools that's still driving policies for poor schools of color. Um, when, when Sandy Hook happened, Barbara Boxer actually um, tried to implement a policy to have National Guard in municipal areas so that there could be uh, law enforcement at the front door of every single school in America. And within three days, it was implemented in LA. And it took a huge like effort we had 90 young people on phone calls across the nation, create a letter, sign on to it, and then hundreds of young people, hundreds of youth organizations, and thousands of individuals signed on to that letter and were able to squash that, that, that effort on her part. But now with Parkland, it's resurfacing again. And the narrative from middle class and mostly white youth is that we need gun control, which we're all in favor of, but that's not going to impact at all the violence toward young people by the police, or that community violence, which we also see as um, as state violence, and I'll talk about that in a minute, which is driven largely by guns that aren't registered, that aren't part of that legal gun trade. Um, and then finally, this kind of narrative that we always get from police and legislators when we talk about police violence, that what we need to do is integrate police departments and that that will change policing. So LAPD, LA County Sheriff's now the most integrated police departments in the nation. If you just look at LAPD, it's about 10% black. This is of their um, sworn personnel. The other thing is more integrated when you look at their unsworn personnel but it's about 10% black in uniform, about 15% women, um, uh, almost 50% Latino, 15% uh, Asian, and yet it's the most murderous police department, not just this year, but for decades now in the nation. And when we looked at homicides in the early 2000s, when the homicide rate overall was much higher, both in terms of real numbers and in terms of a percentage of overall homicides, police killings were actually lower. So now that we've cut the homicide rate in half, we actually have more police killings than we did when LA was arguably more dangerous, to the point where now six to eight percent of the homicides in LA County are law enforcement killing people. And in some cities like Inglewood, 15 percent of the homicides are law enforcement killing people. Um, so we need to challenge these narratives is that you cannot change policing by changing who's in uniform because blue has become the new white. You have to look at the underlying culture and the whole reason, the roots of policing. Um, I think the other thing, the last two things I would say is that um, another challenge with the narrative is something that we would support, but we want to broaden. Policing and incarceration is not just about the Southeast United States and slavery. It's about also the, the um, creation of policing to undermine workers and workers' unions and workers' revolutions and, and eventual to crush unions. Going all the way back to the 1700s when there was you know, armed conflict between worker revolutions and, and armed police and military. It was the dissemination of a policy of, of genocide against Native peoples that was played out by the military and then the police, and it continues to this day. And the use of alcohol and other means, smallpox infected blankets by, by law enforcement, not just guns, to destroy Native peoples and to take land in broken treaties. That's, part, that's one of the roots of our system. And the fourth is court systems that excluded and silenced women and children and said that if you, if you were a woman or a child, you were the property of whatever man you were involved with. You know? If we don't look at the whole roots of our system, it's gonna be very hard, I think, to dismantle the system because we have different roots in different parts of the country. We have settler colonialism that impacts LA and the Southwest that's not talked about at all as a roots. And so it leaves out 
the migrant experience, it leaves out the undocumented experience, it leaves out the indigenous experience in terms of how policing's been built and destroyed people. And I think that's a mistake in terms of our organizing. And then the, the last thing I would say is that for us a huge, a huge challenge is that we have talked about what we need to do in the short term, but we haven't put out a long-term vision of where we want to go. So what does it mean in 50 years when we're no longer a white majority in the United States and we no longer have a national imperialism where the United States is not the main leading empire in the world? What is that going to mean for us? Are we going to replace it with people of color or with other people that may look different but have the same policies as happened in the South Bronx when the South Bronx became no longer white or as happened in South Central when it was no longer white? Or are we going to have a real vision for where we want to go and elect leaders and, and build leadership based on that vision? Most definitely, definitely some big obstacles. <laughs> uh, yeah, Alex and then, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Uh, just to uh, piggyback on, on uh, Kim bringing up Barbara Boxer, one of the biggest obstacles that I see is also liberals and liberals in power. Just this morning I was uh, reading a tweet from Kamala Harris who said that we should replace money bail with risk assessment tools, like that's the solution. And so that, that gives the illusion of progress, right? The illusion that we're actually dismantling something. What we're not, we're just replacing it with more of the same, uh, with electronic monitoring, with risk assessment tools that can further criminalize our communities. And the use of risk assessment tools doesn't mean that we're actually going to decarcerate anyone. That's no guarantee. And so having a, a woman of color toting these like pseudo-progressive reforms is really dangerous. And it, it, and it undermines the work that we're actually doing to dismantle um, here on the ground. You know, liberals have this, this worldview that says that if we just enforce the law equally, neutrally, and professionally, society will be, will be liberated, which is a totally naive misunderstanding of the nature of the rule of law in American society. And this gets to these history issues that, that Kim is raising. In, in the book, I, I don't sketch out the, the LA Marshals and the, and the LA Rangers, but I do have a long discussion of the Texas Rangers, which was the largest colonial police force in the United States for much of the uh, 19th century, whose initial primary mission was to facilitate the extermination of the indigenous population, and then to enforce a system of Juan Crow that drove out Spanish and Mexican landowners and then put in a system that looked very much like Jim Crow through in Texas through the 1960s where Latinos, especially in rural areas, were denied the right to vote. Farm working, organizing was suppressed. People had to use separate waiting rooms and separate drinking fountains just like in the Deep South. So you're absolutely right. That history is not really known. It's not discussed in Texas where I'm from. And it was like a lot of deep research to find this history out. And so what I tried to do was to counter this liberal narrative that the police are just the professional neutral enforcers of the law for everyone's benefit, and to show how policing emerges specifically and concretely to facilitate colonialism, slavery, and industrial systems of exploitation. And that's crucial because when we fall into this trap of thinking, well, if we just make them less biased through implicit bias training or hiring a few more people of color as police, what we're doing is we're just legitimating and re-enabling a system that's designed to facilitate our exploitation. And it will be gussied up in to protect and serve and just the facts map and all this kind of Hollywood nonsense about policing, but we need to always keep our eyes focused on the real function of policing in our society. Laura, did you want to add anything? Yeah, at the, I appreciate uh, folks raising that bit because the I think the legitimation or the legitimizing is really an, uh, a crucial thing that we really uh, work to forefront because there's some that might say like, oh, you know, abolitionists or critical resistance, they're just too extreme or, you know, um, and we'll, we'll kind of levy like uh, criticism of being, not wanting to work like incrementally. 
right? But it's actually, I think Kim laid it out beautifully, the, the no cash, or no new cages, no new cops, no new cash, right? So those, uh, those principles of looking at how we uh, confront this system without legitimizing it, but actually work to delegitimize it, right? And it's not just that the liberal reforms are just problematic or they won't address the, the problem, it's actually that they're gonna legitimize and expand the systems that we're fighting against. Um, and that way that they're, they're really dangerous. So definitely appreciate that. And, and I would just I would just add, and, and which, I, which I know you do, and treat people with dignity and respect, which these institutions have no interest in doing. Um, I'm gonna I'm gonna pose one more question, and I, I really encourage this kind of like dialogue, so it's not just uh, talking at and talking between. Um, is just kind of on, on a basic level, like what have what have been um, really good positive uh, things that you've seen in either in the organizing or in how. Um, policing has been challenged, how it functions. Um, and then also, how can folks in the room kind of get plugged in and get involved in the fight? Well, let's start. I can start. Um, what, one of the things that I really appreciate about CURB and critical resistance specifically is the resistance uh, to uh, policies, campaigns, um, rhetoric that exacerbate the uh, the dichotomy of deserving and undeserving, deserving and undeserving, and Curb has held the line and not supported uh, progressive policies and initiatives that would uh, say that certain folks are deserving of being released from jail, of not being targeted, and other folks will that you know, they're you know they're they're we can we can. Uh, we can forget them, right? And so being able to make sure to take into account of who's being left behind when we're, when we're uh, organizing and when we're putting forth legislation and, and supporting change is really important. Um, abolition is not just for some people and not for other people. Like, it's abolition for everyone. And being able to hold on to, that, to those ideas um, as we're organizing has been really important, really crucial to not undermining our work because then what we're gonna have to uh, go back and fix the, the problems that we created ourselves by not being inclusive of everyone. And in my line of work, I've seen that um, we've been able to pass some legislation like the Mental Health Services Act, which developed full service partnerships. Full service partnerships take a holistic approach to uh, issues that lead to incarceration in the first place, right? So they they talk, they work with clients on housing, employment, education, uh, just across the board. It's a holistic approach, and because they have been so effective, and they're cheaper to run than jails and prisons, and they have to, they're held to a high level of accountability. If you don't show that you're decreasing recidivism rates, you don't get money, right? And so we've seen. In, in the mental health community, we've seen small victories where counties have decided to give millions of dollars to community-based organizations instead of probation. So that's been really, really uplifting. Um, I think for us, some of the first work we started to do was just go to court with our members who were looking at extreme sentences. So I'll just give one example. Um, Sammy Padilla was 14 years old. He only had one small conviction in his past for possession of weed. He was walking home from school and another young man he was walking home from took out a gun and fired at another group of youth across the street. They don't deny a lot of them that they were like babies in a, in a gang war, not that this was like an open hostile, hostile like confrontation, but they all claimed to be a part of neighborhoods, but they really were babies in that effort. And because Sammy and the other two youth that were with that young man that fired were with him under California law, they were held to the same standards and the same um, punishment. And so based on the fact that one person was killed and the other three could have been hit, although no one else was hit, um, Sammy was charged with 25 to life on each of the young people's lives um, or potential deaths. Um, 25 to life gun enhancement on each case, plus a 10 year gun, gang enhancement on each case. Um, when we first went to court with him, it was, it was looking at something like 211 years to life. 
And with all the mobilization at court, um, uh, packing the court for every hearing, getting his family involved, doing a mitigation package, um, talking about his, his, his youth, his lack of any kind of significant past history with the system, the most we could get was like 111 to life on this case. Mm -hmm. And so um, we started to go to the state capitol, um, and we were the only youth voice there. It doesn't mean that there weren't really amazing um, defense attorneys and civil rights attorneys who got involved, but I think it was important to have a youth voice and a community voice there because we were checking them on saying, don't say that young people are more able to change than adults, because it's not true. Adult lifers, when they come home, recidivate at the lowest level, less than 1%. So don't throw adults under the bus or onto the jail bus, if you want to say that. Um, don't talk about sex offenders are less redeemable than others. Don't talk about young people who kill police should be you know, excluded. And I think that, on top of the fact that young people weren't willing to just be spokespeople with their own stories, but really wanted to be there to look at language and to propose our own language, also gave us the strength to like start to write our own bills, which have been, has been really important. But based on that now, there's no life without parole sentences for young people in California. Um, young people between the age of 14 all the way up to age 25 now have an opportunity to have a parole hearing after 25 years, no matter their sentence, um, except for LWAP over 18, which we still have to fight. Last year, we moved um, gun enhancements back under judicial discretion. Um, People already mentioned um, changing, giving people the right to notification, appeal, and removal from gang databases, and ending gang injunctions for the most part, except for a very few individuals in the city of Los Angeles. Um, so I think that, that that has been really, really important for us. I think the other thing that's been important is thinking about how we can be more creative in our actions so that people feel inspired by wanting to join a movement. So, for example, with the gang database, we did a, a flash mob set to Thriller where young people dressed up as police zombies and took over the streets and blocked the intersections in Echo Park. <laughs> and, you know, and so all of Echo Park was stopped, but it really forced them to look at gang injunctions. And then when the, city, when the LAPD came to break it up with a helicopter, it just so happened that Vincent Price's loud voice was laughing at the cops at the same time. So it was just kind of perfect. <laughs> um, or taking, um, having people decorate 617 life-size coffins at that time when it when that action happened, 717 people have been killed by law enforcement since 2000. Now it's 848 since 2000, just in LA County alone. So just closing down the streets in front of the Board of Supervisors with coffins of, of names. Um, again, like a really creative action that brought a lot of people into the work that wouldn't have normally been brought into the work. Um, a lot of love to Critical Resistance who um, and to Curb also, who did an action with us around hazmat jail suits, and the young people loved it, going to the Board of Supervisors with contaminated dirt from the new women's jail, and none of the Board of Supervisors would take that dirt from us. We had little jars for them. <laughs> they wouldn't touch the jars. You know, I remember young people going to that meeting with hazmat gloves and hazmat masks and suits. And stuff. So, um, I think that's been important for us, too, and made it much more fun for young people to be involved. I think uh, the most important <laughs> And, and abolitionist victory in New York has been around uh, stop and frisk practices. While it hasn't been eliminated, we went from five, six hundred thousand a year down to fifteen, twenty-five thousand a year. You know, we don't have perfect numbers on this, but we we know it's a huge, massive shift. And it was the result of a really broad-based effort. So some people talk about, well, the, you know, de Blasio got elected and ended it. But in fact, it was already down like 80% before he took office. That, he didn't nominate Ratner for Ratner. Yeah, Ooh. yeah. So um, then some people say, well, the lawsuits, you know, forced them to change the practices. But really what it was was uh, the combination of that and a huge amount of community mobilization. And what was important about the community mobilization was reframing what the police were calling a public safety issue into a civil rights and racial justice issue. And once it got successfully reframed that way, the tactic sort of basically lost its legitimacy in a way where the police could no longer defend even to their self-picked, you know, community people, the continuation of this massive practice. And I think it's been important in establishing a kind of new logic about policing that we need to build on. So the police will say, we have to do it because it works. 
where in fact you get this kind of Heather McDonald, thin blue line people who say the NYPD is the greatest protector of black lives because we've presented, prevented so many homicides through our intensive, invasive policing practices. But what people said was, first of all, we don't believe it works. And there was some truth to that because when we quit doing it, crime kept falling, shootings kept falling in exactly the areas where they had been doing it. So it, it turns out it wasn't really working. But even if it was working, it wasn't lawful. And people knew that their rights were being violated, they were being illegally searched, they were being stopped without any kind of reasonable suspicion. It was racial profiling. But even if it was done legally, and even if it was done effectively, the community said, it's unacceptable. We cannot treat our young people this way. We cannot create a kind of police state in our communities that treats every young person as always already guilty of something. Because that destroys the community. It destroys the young people's understandings of who they are and their place in our society. And we have a growing body of research that shows how destructive these constant invasive police interactions are to people's sense of who they are. And that's a kind of logic we got to continue with. We can't get caught in this thing about, well, does it work? Show me the statistical model. Oh, it works. Well, I guess we'll have to put up with it now. No, that can not, never be the only measure of whether or not policing is OK. Yeah. And I, I think in particular, looking at the something like stop and frisk is, I think, important um, because it's, it's been much easier to be, to mobilize and respond and be angry about like kind of bigger spectacle incidents, right? And although those are uh, like police killings, say, or shootings, and definitely, absolutely tragic and unacceptable and angering, but I think some of the, the, uh, the caution there is to forget about the, the daily grind of policing. The, the police contact, the stops that actually lead the everyday to humiliation. Exactly. Yeah. And so kind of really centering that as you know, the uh, things that reduce police contact because again, thinking about the prison industrial complex more broadly, police contact is in many ways the first point of contact that people have with the system. They get stopped on the street, searched, arrested, they get booked, they get put in prison, go through the court system, probation, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I mean, at this point, I just want to open it up to, to questions from you all. We've stunned you into silence. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I can't wait to read this the book on ending policing. And uh, also, there's another book that Ken knows a lot about by Kelly Hernandez that I think people would be interested in. And I wondered if Ken could mention that Kelly Hernandez book, because Ken is actually in the book and has a, statement, a significant statement in the book. I wonder if you could tell people a little bit about that. Well, for sure, I urge you to read City of Inmates is the name of the book, and it looks at um, some of the, it, it looks at some of the systems that were created in LA, but I think what's more magical about the book is it looks at the people that fought back in a really beautiful way and powerful way. So I encourage you to get that book. And Kelly's at UCLA, so um, or Dr. Hernandez, Dr. Lido Hernandez, I should say. Um, so she's really accessible if you want her to come out and speak to your group, your churches, your, your organizations, et cetera. I tried to see if we could get her today, but she is in Texas uh, talking about the book there. And uh, I also want to highly recommend the book. And also the, the work they're doing now, uh, she's got a group at UCLA called the Million Dollar Hoods Program that's doing amazing community-based research showing, for, uh, for instance, that there are small neighborhoods in LA where the state, city, county are spending millions of dollars to incarcerate people just from a small community. 
and trying to reimagine how we could spend that money in ways that would actually make us safer. They did a great study that showed that arrests of homeless people every year for like the last 10 years is a, has become an increasingly large proportion of all arrests in the city of Los Angeles, showing how the criminalization of poverty is, a gr is becoming more and more central to what the LAPD is about. And if you want to get involved in Million Dollar Hoods or you have data requests or you want to drop data into it, both Curb and YJC are community partners on that project and so just you could talk to you. Yeah, there, um, on the 15th of May, uh, Million Dollar Hoods is actually going to be releasing their 2017 report on bail. Um, so look out for that. We're putting together a press conference on the 15th to address bail in Los Angeles and we'll be highlighting that report. They're also releasing a report that looks at unemployment and uh, bail, um, so look out for that as well. Can you give us a preview of that by chance? Because I think it's interesting to talk about bail earlier, yeah. about not wanting to go into risk assessment. I don't know enough about it, um, but it bail's bad. It's a bad system. Yeah, a bail is bad. It's um, it's extracted billions uh, from our community over the years. Um, I, off the top of my head, I think it was around the three million dollars that was um, taken from um, from the community uh, in the last year. Uh, I don't know. All, I don't remember all the numbers off the top of my head, but I do remember that the report found that. Uh, black and Latino women were disproportionately affected in that South LA. They look at specific zip codes where this money is extracted and South LA is heavily affected um, and that is shown through the report as well. And this is, an, this is a national movement. There's been a growing awareness about both the way in which it extracts money from the very poorest communities through non-refundable uh, bail deposits so there's bail that you, sh you actually get back if you make your appearance, but there are these bail deposits that people pay when they don't have all the money up front that's non-refundable, and it's hundreds of millions of dollars here in Los Angeles. And, uh, but the other terrible thing about it is that uh, it's about you know ability to pay determines whether or not you have to stay in jail while you engage in plea bargaining. And one of the things we know is that people's plea bargaining outcomes are dramatically worse if they're incarcerated during the process. Mm -hmm. And you get cases like Khalif Browder in New York, the young man who is held in solitary, is abused, and eventually kills himself because of an allegation he stole a backpack, even though the DA knew that the person who made the claim had fled to Mexico and was they couldn't even bring him to trial, but they kept him for three years. Oh because he couldn't pay $3,000 in bail. Yeah, and they use uh, sentence enhancements, so they, they rack up all of these charges and enhancements and use that as a way to uh, coerce people to take these plea bargains. And so that's one of the huge victories of the RISE Act in eliminating those sentence enhancements for prior drug convictions. Uh, it was a three-year sentence enhancement for each prior drug conviction that you've already served time for. But if you get caught with drugs again, then they can charge you adi additional years. And so what we were seeing is that folks were being coerced with these enhancements. Um, and in addition, not being able to uh, post bail. When, when you are able to post bail and show up in court with a suit and cleaned up, you're gonna have a different outcome than if you're coming in with an orange jumpsuit, right? And so that also affects people's outcomes. I think the other hidden challenge with, with the bail um, fight is that people are getting bailed because they're being held to their arraignment. And the sheriffs um, have a huge amount of power to cite and release people without any conversation about bail. Local law enforcement, when they stop you in the street, the most power to cite and release people without any conversation about custody. When you're in custody in LA County, you're supposed to immediately be told about your right to have a, a pre-bail hearing or pre-arraignment hearing about your bail opportunities and your other release opportunities. But there's a little tiny sticker on the on the phone when you go in, so those of us that have been inside didn't even realize that we had those rights. Um, there's a poster sometimes that you see, there, there's just packed with, with information without any kind of graphics. No one tells you of your rights. So the probation department that gets millions and millions of dollars every year to do pretrial release doesn't even see people most of the time until arraignment. We're, we're arguing.
arguing that even beyond the bail conversation, if everybody was assessed within the first few hours of their uh, their custody, and if the majority of people weren't taken into custody at all, if there was just clear parameters around who law enforcement had to release immediately, because um, we don't have even have standard assessments for all law enforcement regarding arrest across the county, um, then we wouldn't even have a bail issue. So yes, fight for um, pretrial release in terms of bail change or ending money bail, but also fight for pre-arrangement release where bail doesn't become an issue. Um, and we have like a, a mini bail bonds industry, like it's like a, it's, it's like a, I'm sure it's the largest in the world too. <laughs> a bail mall outside county jail and outside every other holding tank in the, in the county. So start protesting there because the bail bonds agents have really gotten off being like this hidden foul part and the insurance companies even more that back them up. No pressure on them, no exposure on them. So in addition to putting pressure on the system, the, the more formal uh, out in the sun system that you see, um, find out who those other people are that are getting you know, a lot of money off of people. I just want to say thank you. For, I'm so glad to be here. Um, I had I, this is a random statement, but I totally had this epiphany. I for the, I helped found an organization that is um, working with policing and community stuff, and we've been looking at trauma. And one thing that I've learned from the research that I've read on trauma is that the way to kind of get out of trauma, get out of PTSD, is in a connection with community. And then hearing about um, how invasive policing destroys that connection with community is just really profound. And I feel really invigorated to keep working with this idea of trauma. So thanks. Um, I, my question is, is how, if you can put how in front of this sentence, is how or is it possible to involve the police in dismantling policing? So I don't think it's very possible. People ask me, well, you know, how have the police reacted to your book and blah, 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 and uh, I say I don't really care. Didn't write it for them. They, they're not, they didn't invent the war on drugs. They did not invent broken windows policing. They're happy to carry it out. They generally agree with these things, but also they can't end those things. Now, their unions, they do have political power, and they do fight against us on stuff, and they need to be called out for that. But I think we have to understand these as primarily political problems that are going to require political solutions. So I always say this book is much more about political accountability than it is about police accountability. So I'm not looking to partner with the police. I'm not looking to find common ground with the police. I'm not looking to convince the police. I'm interested in working around them, limiting them, disempowering them, defunding them. I think one of the challenges is that we have a poverty draft when it comes to military policing and prison guards. And it's largely a poverty, it's almost entirely a poverty draft for poor white people and people of color who don't have any other options for a living wage job. And these are like very high paying jobs in comparison to other things you can get without any college degree, with only high school. Um, and then if you have college or you have another language or you're willing to be a canine officer, you get even more bonuses on top of that. So I think we have to talk to our communities about other options other, and, and really push for other options in terms of having living wages in our communities. Um, and then the second thing is I think um, we've been talking a lot about humanizing our own perspective and talking to law enforcement about the fact that while those of us that have been through the system were hurt much more by it and impacted much more by it, I don't want to discount how people that are jailers that are shooting people that are carrying weapons, how that also impacts them, just in the way that torturers in wartime are impacted. Because law enforcement has the highest domestic violence, the highest suicide rate, the highest drug abuse rate, the highest child abuse rate of any profession, even, even beyond like military coming home with PTSD, right? Um, because I think while it's very brutal to invade another nation, that, and then it's way different when you're invading your own nation, I'm not saying that one is better or they're both horrible, horrible but I think that's probably why the PTSD and the suicides, et cetera, is so much higher. Or not so much higher, but it's higher. Um, so I think pointing that out, that this kind of culture of um, militarized policing, militarized war, war economy, and war um, tactics everywhere you go, it, it kills your own family. It destroys your own sense of self. It destroys your own ability to thrive. Um, and it's not a good job. Um, so that, that would be. And then the third thing that I think is really important is as people, um, transfer out of departments or retire or whatever, we need to push for a, a reimagining of departments so that while we work long term to dismantle agencies altogether, we at least replace the workers with non-uniform personnel. 
So like for probation departments, if what, one thing we've been pushing is in the meantime, if you're not gonna like downsize probation, at least make sure that every new hire is a social worker. Or, and I don't wanna like, I'm very careful because I don't wanna make it, them become the new social service agency either. So we have to demand that, that those departments be dismantled and downsized. But I do think there's a way to shift culture from inside if we can get people that have a totally different perspective inside as opposed to constantly recruiting all of their new staff from criminal and juvenile justice um, degrees within community colleges and the Cal State system in the case of California. Can, can, can I just say about, uh, just to add on about the thinking about police and jailers as workers. I, I agree with the NS people, NS people. And I, I'm a, a union leader myself. I'm a vice president in the, in the city university faculty and professional staff union. And I have been working on this issue in relationship to the Close Rikers Island campaign, where the union leadership's response to the abysmal conditions there, the degrading treatment of people, the lack of services, is to build a new maximum security jail on the island. And what I've been writing in the daily newspapers and talking about on radio, et cetera, is that, first of all, most of their members hate working there. The union itself constantly sues the city over the horrible conditions there. And they do come from the communities that the inmates come from. And most of them would much rather be working in their communities doing something positive if it came with the same kinds of wages and opportunities. And so I've been trying to call out the union to say, if you really want to help your members in a way that will make their lives better and their communities better, then let's arrange for real job transfers that protect wages and seniority and benefits into things that will actually help their communities not tear them apart. I had a question in the back. Um, this is for the woman from Kerbin for Kim. We have a new um, initiative here in California that people are trying to get on the ballot that maybe it's more local than it is statewide, where we're um, calling on the county to give the sheriff department, I think it is, subpoena powers. Oversight jail. Jail. The the oversight. Jails ballot right, right. So my question is, is that something that you think warrants our you know, support? Um, I have another question, but that that's the thing. Yeah, so the Reform LA Jails uh, ballot initiative, for folks that aren't familiar with it, it's coming out of the Justice LA Coalition, which uh, YJC, CR, and CURB are all a part of. Um, it would enhance uh, the oversight power of um, the uh, Civilian Oversight Commission over the sheriffs and, increase, and give subpoena power um, and also call for a report, uh, I believe it's seven months from the implementation of the ballot initiative. Um, and the report would outline a plan for Los Angeles County to decarcerate. So one of the critiques around the ballot initiative is that um, the, the calling for a report doesn't guarantee that the report will actually say that we need to reduce the number of people inside, right? However, it does increase oversight power, subpoena power. Um, so that's actually a conversation that curb members are still having around whether we're gonna endorse the ballot initiative or not. Um, it's an active conversation that we're currently engaging. Uh, but giving more power to the community is important. Giving more oversight power to the community is important. But what we'd like to see is actually shutting down the prisons and jails, right? A, a ballot measure, policy that stops, halts the jail construction here in Alton County. And so the question is whether uh, this ballot initiative will move us towards that goal or not. And that's a conversation that curb members are still having. Um, and it, it goes back to the question of like incremental change and, and what uh, Kim outlined, will it give more money? Uh, will it create more beds? Um, will it, or uh, what were the three? And more staffing. And more staffing, yeah. And so I think that's a really great criteria for any uh, ballot initiative or any piece of legislation that comes before us. That's a good, those are good metrics. Um, and we're still engaging in that conversation. I wouldn't have 
one thing that I, I would say, I, I, the reason I like that question is because it brings up the, the, this issue of the, the police oversight commissions more generally. And this is where there might be a little bit, I don't know, maybe some disagreement among the organizations on the panel, but for a good uh, in productive struggle and disagreement. But um, critical resistance generally does not, isn't super, isn't super stoked or excited about police review commissions just because of the relationship that gets created between the commission and the police and some of the rationale of creating the commission. So what we've, and this isn't to say that we can't think of a ideal commission that would have authority, firing power, that they'd be able to like fire police officers or, you know, um, subpoena power and be able to, um, a, a police review commission with ultimate teeth, right? But the way that um, the vast, virtually all police commissions have been framed is that this is an important way to build community police trust, right? <coughs> um, and that that is something that we would want to approach very carefully because obviously police community relations and that trust building isn't something that we want to advocate for. Um, so having a, having a commission that becomes invested in making the police maybe better is something that um, we, we'd be very wary of. So in terms of having a police commission with teeth that is actually like antagonistic to the police would be very hard to put in place, but would isn't completely impossible. We, we actually have the, we, in terms of the LAPD commission here in Los Angeles, we have one of the mo most robust in terms of on paper power structures to monitor the police in the nation. It's got subpoena power, it's got an independent counsel, it has an office of inspector general that reports to and works on behalf of the police commission. It's fully 100% civilian. Those were all things that we all fought for with the Sheriff's Oversight Commission and didn't get anything close to it. The Sheriff's Oversight Commission is only, is only um, advisory. It has no powers. But with all the powers that the LAPD Commission has done, because it's appointed by the mayor and for whatever reason, they're totally ineffective. Yeah. They don't even talk to the community. The, little, the least confrontational thing they could do or the least harmful thing for them and their political careers that they could do is just to engage the community and they don't even do that. So I think the question is, how do you, how can we look at school boards, local water districts, and see how their power has amassed? Is that a better structure? And fight for all civilian, all elected um, police commissions or oversight bodies? Because without that, I, I don't know how well it would work either. I'd want to study against school boards as that brought more power back to the community, um, et cetera. Um, neighborhood councils in some cities are elected. They're, they are here too, but they're not real. They're not, you know. Um, so looking at those models, but I think that would be a better route to go so that you really have independence from the mayor who also depends on law enforcement to put him in office, to keep him in office, to look good in terms of tough on crime and all of that because those commissioners haven't done hardly anything, like two policy changes in the whole time that YJC has been around that we've seen. Alex, could you weigh in on that, especially given that you've been, you know, looking at Rikers. Yeah, I just think we don't have a lot of good examples around the country of oversight bodies producing me meaningful changes in policing. And I would rather see, you know, a massive campaign around legalization or decriminalization of all drugs, decriminalization of sex work activity, you know, uh, a robust campaign around housing first initiatives to deal with mass homelessness. Those are the real campaigns we should be looking to, not tinkering with oversight mechanisms that may just serve to re-legitimate these institutions. And to Alex's point, it is something that Kim brought up earlier um, around funding and our lack of access to funding and control over what to do with that funding. A ballot initiative, if folks haven't participated in one, is very expensive. We're talking millions and millions of dollars to put this on. So those are millions and millions of dollars that are being used for this oversight um, uh, ballot initiative that could be used to legalize drugs, legalize sex work. So in terms of like organizing, organizing strategy, it re like we really have to take into account how these resources are being used and how we're targeting uh, 
the, the policies and the changes that we want to make. And so it, the question is not just, will this help us get to the point where we can decarcerate and shut down jails? Maybe, maybe, maybe not, right? But also, could we be more effective with those dollars if they're used in other campaigns? And so that's, the, that's also a question and a discussion that CURB members are having right now. Thank you. Thanks for that question. Uh, I'm actually going to uh, cap it, yeah, because I do want people okay. to have time to engage. Um, if you do have more questions, um, feel free to come up. Um, Alex will be here. Um, you can get a book and get it signed and engage with the, the organizers. But please put your hands together. Give a round of applause.